And I mean, that's what I have to try to explain. I, have to, I, I define myself as a materialist. I think everything is physical. Just, um, everything in concrete reality, as I like to call it, is uh, physical and material. Concrete reality doesn't mean you know, concrete. Uh, all your thoughts right now are a part of concrete reality because concrete reality just means it occurs in space time. And so it's as opposed to things like numbers, which are not in space time. So have, have I got a pen? Yeah. So, um, I consider myself to be the hardest of the hard most of all the materialists or naturalists or physicalists. I don't believe in anything supernatural. Everything in concrete reality is entirely natural. Um, I have no idea what the, what the constituency in this audience is. But, um, uh, now, some people who think that's true have, have been pushed into the position which I, I like to say is the silliest view that anybody has ever held in the whole history the human race, which is the consciousness doesn't exist. Um, if you want names, um, Dan Denning is one. He, at least he's talking more or less right about it. Um, and there are some more, but uh, clear examples. Uh, Richard Rorty at one point held this view, uh, who you might know from the kind of uh, very other uh, different, very different kind of work. Um, a guy called Paul Firearm. And a lot of people today, or probably a lot of the most fashionable philosophers of mind, probably hold something like this that they're incredibly um, evasive about what they really hold. So, um, so we have this, and right? so everything's, um, everything's physical, nothing supernatural, um, but consciousness is good. So clearly, if you, how many people would like that? Would, I'll put it this. How many people hold both of those views? Oh, gosh, that's not good. <laughs> good, okay. So, um, there are a lot of people <laughs> who think that this is, consciousness is a problem um, because there's a very, um, yeah. What do you mean by existence? It just is. I mean, the world is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sensation that makes you want to be, but it's not an exact thing. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, I already said that concrete doesn't mean it's like you can kick it. It's just, okay. it's actually occurring, it's occurring now. Yeah. Um, so that's all that I need. Um, so, uh, by the, um, so there is a picture of, of, of matter that seems to exclude how could matter be conscious. This is pretty familiar stuff. And there are lots of kind of people appeal to your you know, uh, your imagination or your intuition. And they say, actually, if you look at a brain, you must have heard this. There's this, so so this soggy, pinko gray, pulsating thing, and the sort of waves are very nice. And how can that be, how can that necessarily be the basis of or just be consciousness? And I should say that one of the things I want to do is that I want to think of consciousness as a kind of stuff, not just as a property that something has. As soon as you start thinking you it as a property, and that's because that is a natural way of thinking of a property that something has. As soon as you do that, then you start wondering about what the thing is that has the property. So, um, yeah, I, there's too many pathways, as I was saying to someone, there's too many ways to go, and I'll, I'll just probably get lost in the end circle. Never mind. So, this, that setting the unconscious is kind of stuff, it's part of a, what we call a processual view of reality. It's a, it's a, the picture of, you know, there are objects and subjects and they have properties and it's, it's strongly biotechnical is, is disastrous. That's, I don't think it's deeply undermined <coughs> by the modern physics too. And there is this idea that everything is just a process. So you really need a processual, processual model of uh, what concrete reality is. Uh, uh, the thing. This is the only thing we know deserving to exist. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's why, yeah, that's why the denial of its existence is the silliest thing anyone ever said. You know, this is the only thing we know to And that's a very old idea. Um, you know, that you 
you must have come across standard sceptical arguments about how you should prove or don't accept that there really was an external world. Well, I mean, I'm just assuming there is, but uh, if it comes down to the crunch about you know, the epistemological crunch about what you know for certain, consciousness. Okay, um, let me just, I just want to uh, give you an antidote to the Soviet, the Soviet brain, which is that that's what we, we see when we go to the brain and it's being uh, body. Or indeed, sometimes they do brain operations without anesthetic, and they cover a the hole, they do brain operation, you can see it walking away. And I, anyway, the first thing I wanted to do was to an, an antidote to the Soviet brain picture, which is um, as you all know, that if, if you ask a physicist what a brain is, it's, you know, this inconceivably insubstantial, shimmering thing. Actually, even if you ask what a table is, right, a table is an inconceivably insubstantial, shimmering pattern of charge, it's just energy. Um, so we, we must, we can't privilege the picture of the brain as this sort of thing. Uh, I'm not saying either picture is true or false, but in some sense the physics picture is, is truer, I suppose. And it's just, as you know, 99.999 empty space, except that it is an empty space because it's a quantum vacuum, and quantum vacuum is a kind of pulsating, we know not what. Um, so even when we get hard nosed and physical about the brain, it's this extraordinary, uh, extraordinary thing which we don't really understand because. As you know, physics is full of huge problems. So you should already feel that the claim that that going on, that neural going on, which is which is this shimmering, insubstantial something, just like the table, except that it's much more complicated because of all the neuronal complications. You're being told. I mean, you're being told that is just is consciousness. Uh, another so, sorry, who's telling us that? What? Who, who is I telling you? I am. You are. Okay. No, oh, oh, yeah, I'm telling you that bit, but the other bit the physicists are telling you, right? That it's just this shimmering uh, energy. It's just a, a form of energy. So, the, the, the intuitive gap should be reduced. Uh, and, I, and what I want to argue in the end is that uh, there's really not no serious alternative to panpsychism, but I'm a panpsychist materialist. Uh, I, th I think that everything is physical, but I think the cheapest and um, most plausible theory has to be that, that that physical energy process is experiential, as I like to say. I might say conscious, but it's just it just is experiencing. There is a reason. There's one big reason for saying that, which some of you will reject, which is what I'm. There's this notion of emergence, and there's this. I'm saying, in fact, there is no radical emergence, and I'll explain that. So, standard picture of the physical is all the little tiny bits. And by the way, there aren't any really any bits. Perhaps I should say that too. I mean. The picture of the, the idea that there are different particles or grain particles is over. I mean, it's actually been over for a hundred years um, or, or more. Um, not only are there no particles in the sense of bits, but there are, there are no things at all which can be said to endure through time for any significant length of time. So that's to add to the picture of the brain as this shimmering, substantial. Thing. That said, I'll talk about particles or bits, having to do that qualification so, so the idea is that the physics, you've got all these little tiny bits, uh, and they in themselves are completely non-experiential. I'm going to use experiential instead of constant. And so that's the picture. And then sensible people say, yeah, consciousness exists. But that must mean that when you put these entirely and utterly non-experiential bits together in complicated ways, like they're put together in the brain, somehow experience arises just from spatial temporal arrangements of tiny non-experiential bits. And there's just a, a big division here. I just don't think that's possible. I can't argue for it further. It's clear to everyone that 
This is a kind of Mexican standoff point where you have already got this intuition. I don't think that you take utterly non experiential things, however cleverly you arrange them and make them whiz around each other, that somehow experience or consciousness can arise, i.e., you know, red experience or smell of garlic experience. If you do think that, then uh, that's where you get off on train because. Uh, I mean, the point is, I'm not, there are these things you can you can just you can reject at any point. You can reject things. I'm, I think quite a lot of people think that everything's physical. But most of you, I'm sure, really do believe that there is there is phenomenology or consciousness or experience. Um, if you like me, you don't believe in this, then I've got you, as it were. You have to come with me. But so this is really. The only place you can get off if you accept to. Yeah, I will. Oh, I just want to know what's the difference between radical emergence versus just emergence. Okay, yeah, good. So, I mean, here, there are lots of examples of. Sometimes people call it spooky. Spooky. <laughs> um, there are lots of examples of non spooky emergence, and the classic example is, is liquid. liquidity. So, People say, oh, you take, take a water molecule, an H2O molecule. Well, that's not liquid. It just doesn't have the property of liquidity. But look, if you put lots of them together, the property of liquidity emerges. It's a property of the group, which just isn't there um, in the individual molecule. And that's all true. But, so that's, that's the kind of emergence that's allowed. There's another famous example. I don't know, which is that there's some kinds of oil, some viscous fluids, that if you heat them, you get this hexagonal pattern forming on the surface. It's just something about the structure that means this emerges and it wasn't there before. So the, those are, they're intelligible. The thing is, I think that the li we get, the liquid thing is a bit of a trick because uh, the liquidity. Uh, reduces, uh, that is, you can, totally, you can fully explain it just in terms of the properties of charge and spin and the pounding. It just so happens that water molecules are such that there's these, I think they're called Van der Waals laws. It just means that they slip off each other really easily. So, really, that kind of emergence is unproblematic. So that's what I mean by that. I mean, the, the, the coming to be of something of a completely different order. And liquidity may seem at first like it's a completely different order from an individual molecule, but it isn't really, because it's just, as it were, the slipperiness of the molecules. Yeah. I person that's fusion Two fusion emergence. I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, so, uh, that's the, I mean, that's the, the way, that's the very, the very short version. Um, you have to choose. I think you have, to, you have to reject one of these, otherwise... Well, you don't actually, if you suppose to accept those, they don't push you all the way to panpsychism. Because panpsychism is the view that everything is experiential. Everything there is is experiential to something. Um, there is... A weaker uh, view, which I, I call micro psychism. Uh, you could, so you've got human consciousness, and that's got to emerge. Um, yeah, it's got to emerge, normal spooky. It's got to emerge from the interaction with all the little things. Uh, but if some of them are already experiential, then we can at least in principle see that it, if you put them together in certain ways you might get rich, complicated human consciousness out of civil consciousness. Uh, but you don't, it doesn't actually push you all the way to think everything is experiential because you could think some of the fundamental particles are, but some of them aren't. Uh, but that's a, that's a fairly small concession because most people who like to think of themselves as hard-nosed materialists are already appalled by the idea that you know, the, as it were, the electrons are already somehow experiential. They think that is New Age bullshit. Um, so, I might, I might, yes. 
Yeah. You might say some people they put here perhaps are thinking of dualism, or if, why am I being, why am I saying there's only one kind of stuff? And let me add this word here because what I am above all is a monist. That is, I think there's only one fundamental kind of stuff. Uh, so some people say, well, isn't it easier to be a dualist because there's physical stuff and we have, 20, we have this vivid picture of what that is and then there's consciousness and it seems so utterly different. Uh, but the, the, the basic reply is, the main. Uh, I, I actually think that if things can interact with each other, then you all can count on us being the same sort of stuff. This is getting a bit more technical, I don't know whether you can follow. Uh, but look, I think the quick thing to say about why I want to say that there's not stuff is that look, it's far beyond reasonable doubt now that our consciousness is just things going on in the brain. I, I mean, that's my view, I think. Um, it's so far beyond reasonable doubt that to start postulating radically different realms of entities and for all those who know a bit of philosophy, they, you will know the problems of dualism. You have to somehow try to find a point of interaction where the other mysterious stuff can kind of hook in to the physical system and have effects. And when you try to do that, you come up against some very heavy uh, results in physics. Uh, I just mentioned three. There's uh, what people call the causal closure of the physical. There is never, you know, there is never any, any evidence that, that put it there, put it differently. For any physical thing you take, you can in principle always find full physical causes preceding it. There are no gaps where somehow the, the immaterial the dualist impulse could get in. Uh, and then there's this, there are these two principles, the conservation of matter and the conservation of energy. Uh, nothing is being added or taken away from the physical system. So the case against dualism is incredibly strong. Um, so I think we start with the idea there's only one kind of stuff. I call it physical stuff because it's the stuff that physics studies. Uh, and we know that this exists. And we don't understand how, how things going on in the brain can be, can be your consciousness now, your colour experience right now. But the, the key point here is it's kind of easy. It's just what we don't, what we're underestimating, underestimating here is our ignorance. Ignorance is the key. We think we know more about the nature of the physical than we do. There was something, there was some stuff about this in the piece that was published in the London Review. Uh, it's, a, it's a familiar point that physics only tells us about abst the abstract structure of concrete reality. It doesn't tell us about the intrinsic nature of, intrinsic, of concrete reality. In fact, it can't. Uh, all it gives us are, are equations and numbers. It's almost irresistible, the idea that we know more about the intrinsic nature of the physical than that. But even if we do, um, it's certainly not anything that physics tells us. And Russell is very, very good on all this. Uh, Russell's been kind of pretty well not in Conway at all, because I think Russell used to talk about it. Uh, he's been sort of disrespected by professional philosophers for quite a long time nowadays. But Russell saw this point very clearly, and so did this guy Eddington, uh, Arthur Eddington. So I'm going to, I think I'm, I'm going to read you a quotation from Eddington, which this is from 1900 years ago. It's about our ignorance. So he says, Our knowledge of the objects treated in physics consists solely of readings of pointers. He means you know, pointers on instrument dials. Nowadays it's digital, but... So it consists solely of pointers. But what knowledge can we of the nature of atoms that renders it at all incongruous that they should constitute 
a thinking conscious object. We now realize that science has nothing to say as to the intrinsic nature of the atom. Physical atom is like everything else in physics, a schedule of pointer readings, you know, dials and numbers. The schedule, is that how you say? Schedule, in America they say schedule. The schedule of pointer readings is, we agree, attached to some unknown background. That is, when we point our machines at things, they're, they're recording something. So he says, why, if the background is unknown, why not then attach it to something of a spiritual nature, not spiritual in a um, supernatural sense, it just means mental. Why not then attach it to something of a spiritual nature of which a prominent characteristic is consciousness? It seems rather silly, he says, to prefer to attach it to something of a so-called concrete nature inconsistent with consciousness and then to wonder where the consciousness comes from. And that's the standard situation. The picture of the physical is just non-experiential stuff, and then, oh my God, how do we get consciousness out of that? The thing is, you've already gone wrong. You know nothing about <laughs> the intrinsic nature. So, back to physics. Yeah, this is it. Still on physics, he says, something unknown is doing we don't know what. That is what our theory, physics, amounts to. It does not sound a particularly illuminating theory. I have read something like it elsewhere, Eddington says. The sliding toes did giant gimbal in the way. Some of you know that. There is the same suggestion of activity, there is the same indefiniteness as to the nature of the activity. And yet, from some so unpromising a beginning, we really do get something. The, the reason, the sole reason for this progress is that our description is not limited to unknown agents executing unknown activities, but numbers are scattered freely in the description. To contemplate electrons circulating in the atom carries us no further, but by contemplating eight circulating atoms, electrons in one atom and seven circulating electrons in another, we begin to realize the difference between oxygen and nitrogen. Set, uh, eight sliding toes, gyro and gimbal in the oxygen way, seven in nitrogen. So that's a very powerful <laughs> statement of, which is of something that is very hard for us to get. And Russell says he thinks Russell says he thinks it's extraordinarily difficult to realize how abstract our knowledge of the physical is, how ignorant we are of its intrinsic nature. And what Russell always says at this point is, I'll find another quotation this time from Russell. Russell, I'm quoting, as regards the world in general, both physical and mental, everything that we know of its intrinsic character is derived from the mental side. Yeah, we know, we know this is Russell again, I'm quoting, we know nothing about the intrinsic quality physical events, except when these are mental events that we directly experience. So Russell is the same. The only time you know anything about the intrinsic nature of the physical is in having the experience you're not having right now. That is physical stuff. Yeah. I, I don't know why, I'm not a scientist, and I'm not sort of getting behind a particular view, but I don't know why Russell wrote that, but it's kind of a tested area. That's an after in, in physics. Isn't it? This is for after, I think, from the... Well, is it? Well, <laughs> if you're not asking what I mean by a word. Can I ask you what I mean? Oh, okay. Can I ask you what I mean by experiential? Oh, I just mean consciousness, but what most people mean by consciousness. And I avoid that word because it's been... Uh, trash, I mean, it's for sure. Consciousness, sorry. I'm not saying it. So I just, how many of you have heard this one? There's this famous article called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And the point is just, there is something it's like, qualitatively, for you right now, there's something it's like visually, uh, auditorily, I mean, probably not, 
You can probably not smell very much, but I should have brought a can of spray of lavender or something. Uh, but the, it's just, it's what it's likeness. I think what it's likeness is a rather good term. Because in fact, you can probably feel in your body now everything that you're experiencing right now. What I'm experiencing, yes. uh, your examples are very classical. Yes. It's very splashy trees, splashy yes. trees. I mean, that seems to me to be a very small part of the turbulence that seems to be between my ears. Oh, it is. And it is. I'm and just being. How, see... how do you talk about the rest of it? Oh, please. Well, again, that's like. Or does, does it not matter? That's again, it's not. No, it matters. It's just, I use those examples. Because they're the most uncontested. But now you've raised this issue, I think there's, that's sometimes called sensory phenomenology. Don't blame me for that word, it's very long. Sensory phenomenology, yeah. I think there's also cognitive phenomenology. I think there's something it's like for you right now to understand what I'm saying. So I think there's far more, but I'm just. So I hope that. So I'm on your side. I'm just using the boring standard example because I mean if they have the most immediate. So so here's the, the, the brief version is that if you think that the physical is in its ultimate nature down at the bottom, completely non-experiential, consciousness lacking, you create yourself an enormous problem about how just putting that stuff together in, in, in spatial arrangements produces consciousness. Uh, you have to assume there's some kind of radical logic going on. Um, if you don't, then you don't. I mean, it's just, in that sense, it's a much more uh, elegant and, as it were, cheaper hypothesis that somehow experience is right at the bottom of things. It's completely incompatible with the, uh, the theory of evolution because on both versions, the theory of evolution says, well, consciousness like ours evolved, but if you don't think that there's consciousness right at the bottom of things, then you've got to go, you've got, you need radical emergence for it somehow to pop out of nowhere. If you think that experience is right at the bottom, you can have evolution shaping and forming this already existing stuff into forms that are useful for survival, like visual abilities and so on. Uh, no, I'm, I'm by the way, I should say, I don't think this table is conscious. Like, if you're a panpsychist, you don't think that. Uh, I do think that all the bits that make it up must be, but I don't think that it as a whole is a kind of a, a subject of consciousness. So, that, that's the sort of, that's the kind of joke picture of the panpsychist, but that's not...